Hello and welcome everyone to the very first content event of ISWI 2021. I hope you had a very warm welcome at the opening ceremony yesterday and are excited for the conference from here on. Um, I would like to gladly introduce you to our very first plenary session based on the topic of energy consumption of modern technology. We undoubtedly live in an age of extraordinary technological innovation. However, even though this evolution has brought us immense boon, we must critically evaluate the energy consumption and depletion required to use technology by billions of humans across the globe. In this plenary session, we will talk to two experts to first understand the challenges brought about by large scale energy consumption of modern technology. And then in the second part, learn about cutting edge developments that would address these challenges. With that said, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our first speaker, Professor Kai Uwe Sattler. Um, Professor Sattler is the head of the database, database and information systems group at TU Ilmenau and recently in December 2020, he was also elected the president of our university. Being a foremost expert in his field, he coordinates the scalable data management for, for future hardware program, a project funded by the German Research Foundation. With that said, I give the word to Professor Kai Uwe Sattler, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction and uh, welcome. So I was asked to talk about uh, energy consumption of modern technology. And for me, modern technology is information technology. And that's what um, I'm trying to talk about. So um, here comes a disclaimer. Uh, first of all, this is not uh, the typical talk I, uh, I'm, I'm used to giving because uh, usually I would present or discuss a problem and then um, present a solution. So I have no solutions today, sorry. Second, I'm a big fan of information technology. I think that computers are the most important and the biggest invention of the last 100 years. So whatever I tell you about uh, information technology keeps this in mind. And the third point is, um, I will show you a couple of numbers regarding energy consumption. And I tried my best to get valid numbers from the internet. So these are not my numbers. Um, I try to validate this with diff from different sources. So, but if you Google, you probably find some different numbers. So uh, sorry for that. Okay, let's um, talk a little bit about um, energy consumption. And I would like to give you a few numbers uh, which tell you how it, um, how it works. So currently, uh, the world electricity generation in uh, 2019 was uh, 20, 26,000 terawatt hours. So that's just a number, it says nothing to you, but if we do this uh, and compare this with uh, energy consumption of information technology, then uh, I found a number from 2010, which is 2,000 terawatt hours. And the point is that uh, over the next 10 years from now, we expect, or it's an estimation, that uh, energy consumption of information technology will raise to 8,000 terawatt hours, which is then 21% of the global electricity consumption. So if we just look at information technology, we can say that 45% of the energy consumption is used in manufacturing, building computers, building smartphones, all these devices. And uh, more than 50% is basically for using these uh, devices. And we find 20% uh, for devices, computers, smartphones, everything. We find 16% uh, for networking, running the internet, for example, and 90% for data centers. I have a few more numbers, uh, which yeah, give some insights of what we are doing here. So uh, we are nearly 9 billion active mobile devices, smartphones, sensors, and all. And each of the, uh, them is taking approximately two kilowatt hours per year. Yeah, you can do the math here. 
And um, that means that running the internet, only the internet, everything that's needed to connect uh, as each hour takes uh, 70 tera hours per year. And um, what means 70 uh, tera hours? So I have the energy production of Germany shown here from this year. In total, it's, it's uh, 488 terawatt hours. And you see this is a mix of, of energy production. And you see there's still 26% of coal. And um, so let's say the green energy, hydro, wind, and solar is approximately uh, 45 here. Yeah, so this is, uh, if you see, 48, uh, 488 the, total, the, the country alone. And only the internet is 70 um, terawatt hours. So it's already a big part. If we compare this, for example, with China, one of the biggest energy producer, they produced in last year 7,600 terawatt hours. But the problem here is that most of the part is still from coal, and that is a big issue here. I have more numbers, sorry for that, but let's look at some activities. So visiting Google or visiting uh, Amazon takes this amount, so it's 0 0.0003 kilowatt hours. So this is approximately the same like charging your mobile for seven minutes from a USB connector. Some other numbers here, streaming a song, an MP3 song takes uh, 0.025 kilowatt hours. Um, streaming a five minute YouTube video takes 0065 kilowatt hours. And streaming a full movie, let's say for three or four gigabyte, so for one and a half hour takes 15 kilowatt hours. Online gaming takes much more, so I don't show the number here. And uh, uh, Google alone, as a, as a service provider, as a search engine with all this cloud behind, uh, takes from the word energy already 0.013%. Uh, so, and um, as I said before, that data centers take an important part of this energy consumption. And so wherefore we have to talk a little bit of, about cloud computing and what is a data set. So um, the first question is, what is a cloud? So what can, can you, what do you understand by the cloud? Is this this one? Of course it's a cloud, but not, not the cloud we are talking about. Is uh, this a cloud? Yeah, it's uh, sold as private cloud, but that's uh, marketing bullshit. It's not, it's just a disk. Yeah, a network attached disk, but not a cloud because uh, we have a very different understanding of, of cloud computing here. So cloud computing is uh, on-demand on demand availability of computer system resources, like data storage, like networking, like uh, computing power over the internet. So that's what we understand typically as cloud. And of course, there's uh, many, there are many use cases here. So the main idea of cloud computing is that um, if you take traditional computing where you have on-premise, yeah, you have your machines running on your, on your organization at your home, then it's like having a power plant nearby your house. And uh, energy is only produced for you. So if you move on or switch to cloud computing, it's more like this. We have an on-demand utility. We don't need computing resources at our home, we just rent it. And it's like plug in, subscribe, and pay per use. It doesn't mean it's cheaper, but it's uh, more efficient, as we will see later. So, um, what is a data center? Because that's a, uh, the heart of the cloud. This is a data center. That's a typical data center you can find from the big players like Amazon, Microsoft, Google. So, it's a quite boring building, um, and there are not many people working for this. So, even the big hyperscale. Uh, data centers require 50 to 100 employees, so it's not really um, a number for employment here. And from the inside, it looks like this, and you see a lot of computes here, yeah? And if you look at the numbers, um, so we can say the um, a data center is uh, just a huge collection of computer servers to provide IT services of different uh, kind. Um, one of these data centers, and we're talking about the most biggest one, we have a small one with just a few computers, but we have uh, this biggest one like this, uh, use up to 100 megawatt per data center. That's sufficient to power 80,000 US ho households already. Um, the total, or the, the estimated total number of, of servers running in these data centers all over the world is 18 million. And in some, we take up up to 500 terawatt hours per year. So you could say, well, that's a big thing. Uh, why do we need this? Yeah. 
And we also should know that uh, the big three, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, represent all, all already two-thirds of all the rentable computing services available in the world. So this is a very big thing here. And it's also a big market. Um, only in the last, in the first quarter of the last year, 30 billion of US dollars were spent on cloud infrastructure to build this cloud infrastructure. So we are every week a new data center is basically built. So that you could ask who is using this, who needs this? And I have some um, examples here. So of course, there are these internet companies. All the companies you know is at Amazon, cloud, um, Google, but there are many others. So on, on Amazon, on the Amazon Cloud, Amazon is called AWS, Amazon Web Service, the biggest user is Netflix. And then we have Twitch, LinkedIn, Facebook, ESPN, and uh, many others. On the Microsoft platform, which is called uh, Azure, the biggest user is Wikipedia, and then there are Baidu, Twitter, and eBay, and others. So this is one use case, one of the main customers here. And there's a lot of other things you can do, you can use. So it's used or can be used as a rented compute and storage platform. And usually we talk about three levels of services that are available here. So first is infrastructure as a service. So you can just rent a machine. It's an empty machine. You could can put any operating system you want, and you can work with this. The next level is a platform as a service level where you can deploy your own developed application. So you build an application, a web uh, application with a web browser and some logic in a database, and you can run it there. So that's the second one. And the third one is what is called software as a service. So if you just rent a piece of software to work with this, so an office package or email program or customer relationship uh, management software, this is software as a service, and that runs also um, on the cloud. So let's look at, uh, at some uh, numbers from data centers. So again, the question is, who, why is this necessary? Why do we need this huge capacity of, of internet resources? And uh, the reason is there is a very, very big appetite for computation. And I just give you one example. And this example is Netflix. You probably all know them. So Netflix spends 10 million US dollars per month just to rent resources as AWS. And uh, we are re uh, responsible. We cover 30, 70% of the whole internet traffic in the US only for streaming videos. Yeah. Um, I have some other numbers um, from this uh, report. Um, it's already uh, eight years ago, but so we can imagine it's so much higher today. And it's uh, a few numbers which uh, tell us what happens every six or within 60 seconds. Yeah, and uh, we send or we send more than 200 million email messages around in just one minute. We send um, 5 million Google searches every minute. We have uh, 1.8 million likes on Facebook. We have uh, more than 300 tweets on Twitter. And we are uh, um, uh, more than $270,000 are spent for merchandise on Amazon. So this is a whole um, of a big traffic that requires this infrastructure. And uh, if you just look at, uh, at um, the energy consumption of such a data center, you see that for the actual servers, only 33% uh, of, of the electricity is used for computation. Yeah, whereas a little bit for storage, 11%, whereas 3% uh, uh, for networking. But most of them, actually the same as for servers, uh, is 43% just for cooling and power provisioning. So this is the biggest issue, cooling. Yeah, and therefore, uh, these big providers try to move their data centers to places um, on the world where cooling is not a really issue. But power provisioning, of course, is the one thing. So um, the question is, is it good or bad? Yeah, it's a lot of energy consumption, so the question is, can we get rid of this? Uh, but it's a little bit like the question, which of these uh, two transportation is a better one? And I have two examples. So the first is this one here. So just let's assume that in each of this car, only one person is sitting and we all try to drive to the same place. So is this a good one? So that's like everybody has its own computer on premise. On the other hand, we could have this transportation where many people use the same, the same resource, in this case, okay, case C is the same car. And of course, there's a much better utilization as you can see. 
And in fact, if we look at the common server, compute server uh, utilization across the industry, the utilization is between 10 and 20%. So typically most of the machines we have running at home, in our offices, in the organization, in companies are idling. They don't do nothing. Yeah, and that's a problem. So um, cloud computing might help to improve this. So there are numbers from, from Amazon. I don't know if we can trust them, but uh, probably we have a high, a much higher utilization, they tell us. So uh, we have a utilization of 65% because they are able to combine all the computation they have. And the, re the technical reasons for this are uh, on-demand computing, so you, you rent a machine only if you need it, whereas elasticity, so if you, you can, grow your problem, you can rent if you want more machines within a few minutes, and there's also the concept of virtualization. And uh, what helps here is this so-called economy of scale. So um, one, one big thing in this uh, data center is, of course, artificial intelligence. Yeah, so very hot topic um, in, in many areas, and uh, we want to have a, a quick look at um, the energy consumption of AI. Um, so the question is what, is, what is AI? What means artificial intelligence? What do we understand here? Uh, I have a very simple example, which is one of the, let's say, most prominent examples, and that's a classification problem. Yeah, so the, the goal is you have a, um, an image from your camera, or you have an image somewhere downloaded, and you want to, uh, under or your, your the AI should tell you which kind of, of, of animal is it. So is it, in this case, a dog or a cat? But it's the same on your smartphone where you have, for example, your face ID and you want to um, unlock your, your smartphone just by looking at, uh, at your camera. Yes, it's the same problem. So what we have to do is we have to define or to get a, a, um, a function that from the image, from a set of features, we get a class. The class could be ever the, the animal or could be is it you or not. And for this, we need features. Features are attributes, uh, properties of an image, it could be uh, the pixels, could be the color distribution, could be something more complex. And our problem is now to train this, yeah, to learn or train this function F that I've shown here. And for this, we need um, images which are annotated, where we say, okay, this one is a cat, this one is a dog, this one is you, and this one is not you. And by this, we, we can derive this function. If we have this function, we can finally say, this is a cat. Yeah, so this is from this function. So this is uh, the main idea of machine learning. So whereas the term of deep learning, which is, let's say, kind of extension from this, we don't have to do this uh, all with, with deep learning, where also statistical methods, uh, whereas neural network and neural network technique is one base of this deep learning. And the main idea of deep learning is that we uh, try to learn, try to derive this function with a network where we have these neurons here, which are connected by these lines and the neuron gets always input from other neurons. Yeah? And the goal is now to adjust the weights uh, to, um, which are associated with this uh, connection. So that's the main idea of learning here, so in, in, a, in a few seconds. And um, the power of this AI technology is that we don't have to define these features by hand. It's uh, done automatically. So we start with, with pixels, and we detect edges, contours, parts, and so on. And finally, we can say, this is a dog, this is a cat, or this is a cow. Okay, so this is uh, machine learning in, in 30 seconds. Uh, let's look at um, what's the time and the cost for training. Yeah, because this is very important step of uh, artificial intelligence and we need a lot of data. And for this, I have an example. And this example is Bird. So Bird is this yellow guy, but uh, what, what I would like to introduce as Bird is um, a model, a machine learning model. And BERT stands here for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. And that's a model for natural language processing. So it's needed that your, your, your smartphone understands what you are saying, yeah, or your, your uh, smart speaker at home understands your commands. And this model, which is a very well-known and very successful and very powerful model, was trained by Google from more than 3 billion words uh, with more than 300 million parameters. And it takes, the training with all this data takes 40, 70 minutes. That's not a long time, not by Google, that was basically the world record of training. But this was done 
on 92 NVIDIA machines with more than 1,400 GPUs, very powerful computational devices. And each of these machines costs you 400,000 euros or dollars and takes 10 kilowatt per machine. So taking uh, 92 times 10, one hour, you get a uh, feeling what this uh, needs, yeah? So training with big data requires also a lot of energy. However, there's some good news. Um, first of all, not all problems need to be solved with AI. Of course, yeah, if your only tool is a hammer, then everything is a nail. But we don't need AI for all problems we have in uh, computer and in, in many domains. The second thing is, you don't have to train this model again and again. We, you can just reuse this model, yeah? If you trust that Google has done it in the right way. And this is called pre-training, and there's also a technique called transfer learning, where you take a model and can adjust this model. And finally, and we are going back to this data center idea, you could simply rent the computing infrastructure. Yeah, you can go to Amazon, to Microsoft, to Google, and then you can train your models with your data on this hardware, and you don't have to buy it yourself. Okay. Last topic I would like to cover here, which is also very relevant for energy consumption in IT, is our crypto uh, currencies and the uh, blockchain idea. So wh what are cryptocurrencies? Um, yeah, it's a digital asset that is used or designed to work as a medium of exchange. So if you want to exchange something, um, I give you something and I uh, get something else from you, then uh, these cryptocurrencies would be a a useful tool and we could also say it's just electronic money so um where basically on the world two kind of no more there are more but let's say uh, mainly used are two kind of of money so one is a fiat money and the second are the cryptocurrencies so fiat money is something that you already know like this one yeah or euros or whatever and it's called fiat because uh, yeah it has no value at all so it's typically established by a government rules or by a federal bank and as I said, it does not have any intrinsic value. That's just a piece of paper. Yeah? And the only value comes from because I trust and you trust in the federal bank or in the government or in, in, in somebody who is, is issuing this. So that's the only reason. So because we all believe that we get something back if we, uh, if we exchange this, uh, this piece of paper, this uh, uh, kind of money works. Cryptocurrency is different. And you probably know the most prominent one, which is a Bitcoin here. And, uh, but it does not exist in physical form. So even if you see these coins, this is nothing. That's just something, a replacement for the money. Yeah? It uh, doesn't hold anything. And the difference uh, to this uh, other money is it's not issued by a central authority. No government, no federal bank is issuing this. And it's uh, what also important here is that, uh, it has a decentralized control of creating coins, of transferring money, so no single bank. Yeah, and um, it's typically based on blockchain. So if we talk about cryptocurrencies, we have to talk about blockchains. Let's say, uh, let's see if we can uh, introduce this again in a few minutes. So uh, blockchain is a great new technology. That's what the fanboys of blockchain will tell you to build systems like this, secure and safe. Yeah, sounds good. So, um, but in fact, what we need, and that's also the same for any other system, like a banking system, we need a, a system that represents ownership, that you own some money or not, and transitions. I send you some money, so this is a transition. Yeah, we have one state and we change the state and we have to represent this. And the states could be a bank account, could be money, could be a state, could be bookings, so this kind of system. So it's a very, very uh, important and often used system. And transferring ownership to somebody else means we have some sales, we have some money transfers, uh, estate transfers, whatever. And that's, that's, that's the most important thing here to make this safe and secure is to avoid double spending. So double spending means we, don't, we, we are not able to sell the same object twice or spend the same money twice. So spending money for one piece of a product and the same money is the same um, yeah, cash or the same bill to another one. That should be avoided, yeah? And with physical money, it's easy because uh, if I'm not able to make a copy, a valid copy that somebody else is accepting, I have no chance for, um, for double spending. But if it's just a digital, a digital thing, a digital asset, it's more difficult. So 
what do we need? We have three building blocks here. The first is we have to, I, uh, we need, or we, are, we should be able to identify the actor. We should know it's a bank, it's another person. The second is we need kind of a ledger, a registry, because we have to represent the states. So your bank, your physical bank, typically knows that you are a customer. You are, can be identified by your, your uh, credit card, for example, or by logging in to a website, and they know your state, your bank account. And then the third one, the third component, as we have, we have to, con we should be able to control this uh, uh, transition between states, and we call this a transaction. And of course, the uh, obvious solution for this is to have a central authority, like a federal bank. But there is some disadvantage that we all know. So there is a problem of censorship. Where is uh, this central authority is vulnerable to attacks? Uh, scalability is an issue. And wherefore the idea of, of a distributed setting. Yeah, and then we are back in this blockchain world. So what's the principle here? So the blockchain is, uh, first of all, a distributed system for managing data records, transaction, and to achieve consensus on, on this state among all parties. Yeah, so, and that's without a central authority. So that's the most important thing here. And uh, what's also important here is that the participants um, where the parties here do not need to know each other. That's different from a typical banking scenario. Uh, we do not have to trust other participants. That's also very specific here. And can still agree on a state, and they have to uh, agree on a state. Yeah, Otherwise, it would not work. So um, the name blockchain comes from block and shape. So we start with the initial empty state, so there's nothing, no, nobody has any money. And then we have transaction. The transaction says, I give um, this person uh, $10, this person received 20 euros, whatever. Yes, this is a transaction, very simple. And then we form from this transaction a block. And this block represents a state. So then so we have this concept of a block, and then we need a concept of a chain. So a chain is that one block refers to another one. So this block refers to this, this block refers to this. So how do we do this chaining? We take this block, calculate a cryptographic hash, and store it here. So this is uh, the chain. Yeah? And that means each block is based on its, its predecessor. So we can say, first, transactions are grouped into blocks. Second, blocks are immutable. It's not allowed to modify, and it's not possible to modify the block, otherwise it would not work. Yeah, so we need concepts for this. Blocks depend on one another. That's what I explained with this uh, chaining. And anyone can form a new block at any time because it's a distributed, decentralized approach. So uh, we said before we have to avoid uh, double spending, which is a kind of uh, manipulation. Yeah, and it's important because you should know that each network, each participant, has a whole copy of the full blockchain on its own machine. So it's like you have the full bank at home. Yeah. And you could say, oh, I modify this. We should avoid this. So let's assume this is our blockchain. And now let's try to manipulate. What can we do? Let's assume I have a transaction, uh, Bob sends and $10 here. And I want to modify this. I want to modify this transaction. So, um, and I say, okay. I take this and I change this transaction and uh, now I say Bob sends N $1,000. Is it possible? Yeah, of course we could modif modify it, but then the hash we have calculated before is now different. Yeah, if we calculate now, we get a different hash value and it's not the same as uh, before. So it's, this block is invalid. So the full, the, this chain is not correct anymore. Okay, it doesn't work. But uh, what happens if we try to modify the full chain here? Not only one block, but we recalculate all the other blocks. Would this work? It would look like this. So I have this block, and instead of the original one, I create a new one, and another one, and so on. But uh, where is the rule? And the rule is uh, it's always the valid path is only always the longest, and all other parties have to agree on the longest path. So as long as you are alone and not powerful enough to change or to convince all the other participants, then you are not, you are not able to modify this. So it's uh, kind of secure.
but this agreement is the most important concept of this uh, of this um, blockchain idea and therefore we have to um, discuss how can we agree yeah well, how is this agreement done so um, if you have a background in computer science, you probably know consensus approaches, where so a huge family of very interesting algorithms that try to get an agreement among a number of processes. And it's like this. So let's assume I have this group of people here, and this red little boy in the middle would like to get a vote. Yeah? And, um, he asks all the others, please vote yes or no. And then they give an answer, say yes or no, and then you can just take the majority, and then you have it. Yeah? The problem here is, you have to know all the other participants and this uh, kind of Byzantine failures where people lie. Yeah, so this is very difficult to handle. So it's not really a good uh, thing for this con for this idea of blockchain here. So what they do, and we have a so-called proof of work or POW, P O W. And the idea is that creating a new block which is needed to extend this chain is should be expensive in time and computation. And this, this can be simply done by just request to solve a computational task. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, this uh, task can be validated very simply. You just check it and it takes you um, just a few uh, instructions or a few seconds to do this. So it's like this. You have a task, something to calculate. And who, uh, whoever wants to create a new block has to solve this computational task. And then all others, all other participants, all other nodes can just validate it. Yeah. And um, to make this uh, safe, this part of work is uh, part of the newly created and published block. So if you receive a block, you can check if this proof of work is valid. And if that means if this block is valid. And of course, only blocks with a valid proof of work are valid blocks. So what is this proof of work? In uh, Bitcoins and other uh, cryptocurrencies, it's uh, called a hash cache. And the main idea is we take a hash value uh, from a previous block, we check the transactions we, which we have to group in the block, we have a so-called nonce, so just a random number, then we apply a hash function, something like this, you know, the math is not relevant here, so we get a number like this, and then we just check if this number is less than a certain threshold, which is predefined. And if it's yes, then uh, we have solved our task, yeah, and we, we have this block, and if no, then we have uh, to do it again, and we do it with the next number here. Where, so there's no way of guessing, there's no clever algorithm, you just have to do it over and over again, and you get this number. Very stupid work, yeah? So, and that's uh, used in Bitcoin. Um, so this is a symbol of Bitcoin, but it's not, as I said, not really the Bitcoin. Currently, it's a distributed system of uh, network nodes. So we have approximately 10,000 nodes today. Uh, the blockchain is uh, kind of a database, a file of uh, more than 300 gigabytes. So you can even put it on your laptop if you want. Um, each block trans uh, stores the transactions, as we have seen. So this is a transfer of Bitcoins. Uh, there is no real account. So you cannot just look up a database and see your account. So it's always a result of the money you have spent or received. And uh, what you have is a wallet, and this is kind of a, yeah your account, but it's not really, it doesn't contain your blockchain, it just get, stores the digital credentials that you need to access your blockchain, uh, to your, your bitcoins and to spend your bitcoins. And again, adding new transaction requires to create new blocks. So let's come to this um, important problem, and that's actually my point, um, how to get new blocks. Yeah. Creating a new block is what is called mining. Something like this shown here, and it's create a new block and add them um, to the blockchain. And by this, you have to provide the proof of work. Today, it's done every 10 minutes. Um, and the question is, why is it done? Yeah, because we have to, uh, this system requires that we are able to create new money. Yeah, otherwise, we could just exchange money. Um, again, it should be done uh, decentralized. And you still can ask, okay, why do we do people this? Yeah, because they get the reward. So if you are a successful miner, meaning you have a valid block created, you receive the mined bitcoins as well as uh, the fees of the um, uh, transactions. And today, uh, in these days, it's approximately six bitcoins. And uh, if you have, some, uh, if you know the value, it's between thirty and forty thousand dollars today. So it's a lot of money you can uh, buy. You can 
earn by creating a new block. So, uh, but you shouldn't try this at home. Yeah, that's nothing for, for your, your laptop because today it's done with special hardware, specially designed chips, and it's typically done in this farm. So this is a small one here um, because today it's, uh, as I said, uh, done on dedicated hardware, as really specialized for this simple task that I've shown before in uh, data centers. And that's the most important thing here, it was low cost electricity. The largest farm is in China, it's a Dalian mining farm, and um, we are able to produce currently 750 Bitcoins per month. Again, times is $40,000 um, per Bitcoin. So you could ask why China? It looks like um, a system, an approach uh, that should run in the US, in California, in Silicon Valley, or in Europe. Uh, it's not only China, it's also Kazakhstan, it's Iran. And the reason is this one. This is, these are the electricity prices per kilowatt hour in US cent. You see Germany around 38. You look at the US about 15. China is below 10 and Iran is around one. And that's the, the main point. Yeah. If you have, if you, because you need electricity for all this computation and this electricity goes basically into, into the value of these bitcoins and that makes it cheap or expensive. So with the German electricity price, you have no chance to do it. That's actually not a problem, but remember what I've shown before. So most of the stuff here is done with coal. In the, in, the, in the inner China region, they have a lot of these coal power plants and they produce very cheap uh, energy and they use it for this Bitcoin. So you could ask, this is a, still a great idea. Um, again, I have some numbers. Uh, the energy consumption of Bitcoin mining is 70 terawatt hours per year. It's the same that we need to run the internet. So you can decide which is more relevant, more important. Um, by the way, it's the same amount as Austria or Argentina. The annual carbon footprint of Bitcoin mining is uh, 35,000 kiloton carbon. And that's the same amount as New Zealand in one year. For each transaction on a Bitcoin, we need 850 kilowatt hours. We produce around 400 kilo carbon and technically there's a limitation of 30,000 transactions per hour. Just for comparison, I have a number of uh, numbers of, uh, from Visa, but um, I think MasterCard and others are very similar. So a credit card transaction requires between one and two watt per transaction and they can process more than 200 million transactions per hour. So compare this. So does it make sense? Um, finally, all this Bitcoin and uh, all other um, um, cryptocurrencies are mainly used as speculation object. It's not really for payment. It's not because it makes not much sense if the value is changing so much. So most people try to get it in the hope that they make money later if the, if the value is high. Yeah, let's come to a conclusion. So what can we learn from all of this? So while looking for numbers, I found a nice uh, citation and I think it's uh, actually the most important. So the greenest power is that which is not consumed at all. Yeah. So we can ask, so should we get rid from all this IT stuff? Yeah, would we go back to times where we had no smartphones, no computers? Or should we go back to times where the internet was just a, um, a secret network for, for a few computer science people like me. So um, I don't know. So that's something you should decide. But I would like um, to, um, to, to uh, yeah, emphasize uh, a few things. So first of all, I think you should think twice if you blame your parents, your neighbors, your friends uh, for energy consumption and your carbon footprint because we all, with all the services we use, we have a, a, a impact here. I would say think twice how to use IT devices and services. Yeah, I, I've shown the numbers. And I would also say, please uh, think twice before you invest in all this cryptocurrency stuff here. By this, um, I would like to thank you and I'm open for question later. Thanks.
So thank you, Professor Sattler, for this um, for painting the big picture perspective um, of the problem we are talking about, and also introducing us and providing an overview of some latest developments. I'm sure this has sparked several questions for our audience, and we will get to them at the end of this session after the next speaker. And uh, before we move on to the next speaker, we will have a quick five minute break so that we can set things up for him. So stay tuned, we will be back in a moment.
So hello and welcome back, everyone. I am sure you had enough time to think about um, the first speech or the first contribution. We will now move on to the second contribution. And for that, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Professor Martin Ziegler. He is the head of the Micro and Nano Electronic Systems uh, Department at TU Ilmenau. And he also coordinates the ambitious MEMWERK project, which actually aims at developing highly efficient electronic systems of the future that are inspired by biology. So with that said, I give the word to you, Professor Celia. Yes, thank you for your kind introduction. And I'm very happy um, to be here, first of all, and very happy about this here topic. Um, about our future and there is not a planet B, then this is really one thing uh, which strongly drives my research to find new ways of information technology. And um, as an outline, um, you already heard in the talk from Kai, um, there are some dark clouds over our digital paradise. And um, you know in principle already what is the reason for that is energy consumption. And I will repeat, and I'm happy to find similar numbers like you, Kai, <laughs> on the internet. Nevertheless, I like to put it onto another context. Now, I'm a hardware guy, I'm building um, hardware systems, so I have another view on the things. Kai comes from the software side, I coming from the hardware side, so you please stay, you will learn something new. And I will talk about a plane B, and plane B is perhaps not the right word you hear from Kai. There's not a clean, uh, not much more time to do this. That's why I call this as a plan A. Uh, this is something we have to do yeah, and we have to act now. And all of all, I talk about neuromorphic electronics and this are the projects from our neuromorphic lab here in Ilmenau. Um, mainly the project member I asked um, to be uh, presented here and yeah, you will um, learn something about neuromorphic electronics later in that talk. So let's start um, with the fundamental limit. So every yeah, um, calculation has this um, cost, its energy cost, and the minimum from a physical limit is given by the Landau limit. So this is the minimum energy which is required from set from zero to one. And the number is relatively small. Yeah, it's um, around, so I have no presenter here, eight in the power of minus 28 kilowatt hours per bit. Yeah, it's a tiny number, it's a zero, and then comes 28 digits, and then comes uh, 27, and then comes the eight. It's a very tiny number. So question is, okay, this is a physical limit. Yeah? Below it's not working. Question is now what our current technology can do it. So when we build up, that's in hardware, that's a switch. And this is something about um, three and then comes in the power of minus 21. So again, a zero, then 20 digit, then comes a three kilowatt per bit. You would suggest also a tiny number. Yeah? And when you put this in relation to the daily energy consumption, what you have, at least this is four kilowatt hours. Yeah? This is perhaps not what you learn and what you see, your daily energy consumption. This is actually the daily energy consumption where you pay for, which on the bill for the electricity. So, um, but now let's bring this in hardware, what this means and where we come from. And from that, I like to introduce in here a very famous law. It comes from Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore, you see here a picture from 2004, and Gordon Moore was one of the founder of Intel. No? Intel, you know, it's a company uh, building processors and computers and so on. And what he has um, previewed in the 60s of the last century, and which is known today as Moore's law, is that the numbers, this is here in this yellow, or uh, in this orange box, that the number of components, a yeah, number of such switches in a dense integrated circuit, means in a processor and so on, doubles approximately every two years. Yeah? What this means every two years is, and this is um, his um, 
original diagram, which I stole from his um, publications. And what it means is it's an exponential growth. Yeah, perhaps you're not so familiar with uh, the scale. It's a logarithmic scale, but uh, exponential growth, you, we know at the moment, and that's actually what we have with the pandemic. Yeah, with the virus is a, is a strong slope in the growth. And now um, this was in, two, uh, in 1964 or 1965. And here you see the real evolution up to 2018. And the first yeah, integrated circuit, the first processor, if you like, on a computer from Intel, that's a famous 4004, has around 1,000 single switches, transistors. No? And today, we have something at um, 10,000 million yeah, in a normal um, core i9, i7 of transistors. Yeah? And this is a massive, a tremendous increase of devices into, uh, into such kind of a processor. And when you just put this into relation to some other areas, and this um, I like very much when you think on a flight from New York uh, to New Zealand. Yeah? This would take, in our days, when the flight duration is from 1970, in our days it would take something like the time you have to fasten a seat belt. Yeah? And this is actually, the, and this is always I say to my students, this is actually the success, what you see here is the success of our modern technology, that we are able to produce so many transistors in a dance or so many of these components of the switch into an integrated circuit. Now, let's go back to um, some numbers. And um, when you just calculating from this energy consumption per year and the, these numbers, I'm happy um, to see also from the um, from the slides from Kai just before. So we find, we also, I also look on the internet and we find the same numbers and we're not talking to each other before means we have some verifications of that numbers, at least under us too. <laughs> and um, I would say roughly 25% yeah, you use for ICT. At least, again, this is um, the electricity what you pay. Yeah? It's not what you use. And this uh, numbers you know already, so I can go slowly, uh, fast over that. Yeah, um, How many, it runs the internet, what is this mobile devices, Google alone, 0.01% uh, uh, of the world's energy supply and so on. And here streaming a three gigabyte movie, yeah, 15 kilowatt hours, in principle 3.6 times your daily energy consumption. Yeah? So please don't stop now uh, to stream that talk, but just say, or a video game, 20 times this daily energy consumption. Yeah? It's a massive number. And um, when you look a little bit closer, um, what all contributes to that, and this is what uh, Kai explains to you, you see that data centers, devices, also the production and for networks all together um, will lead that um, our energy consumption rises to about 21% at the end of this decade. Yeah? This is the first information from, this, from, from that um, graph. Yeah? The second information, when you look to the curve, you're already perhaps familiar with that, you have an exponential growth again. Yeah? And what it knows, the exponential growth, and when we look a little bit after 2030, yeah, and when you just continue here by the devices, you will end up at 2037, so 15, 20 years. And then we reach here a very important limit. This is the global energy production. Yeah? This is what the world produces that energy. So it means from today, 15 years, when we are unhappy, 15 years, and we not have enough energy. This is uh, why I say there is no time for a, bay, uh, for a plan B. You know? We should talk about a plan A here. And um, I like to continue a little bit in shocking you. Uh, also a point you heard already from, from Kai 
um, and I like to explain this point a little bit from the other side, is in 2016, when you look just to the data centers, there was here an announcement that was written in German, but what the newspaper has told in 2016, the airport in Frankfurt, which is one of the biggest airport, or is, I think, the biggest airport in Germany and one of the biggest in Europe, yeah, consumes less energy than the server farms what are located in Frankfurt or in the area of Frankfurt. So all the server farms um, needs more energy than the whole airport in Frankfurt. Yeah? And when you just look on, on that and ask yourself, and here's an estimation from the American um, um, semiconductor research foundations and what you ask how many data what is the global memory demand yeah then you will see that again in 20 years 2040 or 15 years we end up something like three in a conservative estimation 10 in the power of 24 bits yeah or in a in a perhaps more um Trustical estimation, something in 10 in the power of 28 bits. No? So we have several thousand of theta bytes. No? And theta, I have also have to look it up. What means a theta byte? It's a one with 21 zeros. Yeah? And there will 100,000 of this. This is a global demand of, 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 of memory, what we have. And you can compare this number. It's always good to compare this number, what you typically have on a modern computer. I think the hard disk in a computer is around one terabyte. At the moment, it's more or less standard or half a terabyte. And this is 10 in the power of 12, a one with 12 zeros. Yeah, this is actually the, the energy demand. And just, you can ask a very simple question is, um, how can we, can we just uh, fabricating devices to store so many data and the material what we use is silicon. Yeah? Silicon is a material uh, where all our um, devices are made for. And again, the same estimation in uh, 20 years or 19 years, we have something like 240,000 tons what is supplied by that important material. So, and now just a very rough estimation, I'm not say this is correct, but I take here the, the lower bound from the slide before, this is what you see here. And then I take a number for how many gram of this um, um, silicon you need per pit. Yeah? And what you see is then you, have, you need 20, uh, 24 million of tons. Yeah? What tells us this small estimation, we have not enough silicon. Yeah? means um, purpose is good not to throw away your mobiles every second year. <laughs> the silicon inside will be very expensive. Yeah, it's perhaps more expensive than gold in the future. You are lucky. Good. Question, of course, rises. This is the dead end of ICT. Or what is about plan B or plan A? Huh? I claim I will talk about plan A and I hope I motivate you um, it's really urgent that we start with our plan A. And um, for that, what we can do is purpose is always good to look a little bit back in history. Yeah? And today we talk about we are in, or in the middle of the fourth digital revolution. Uh, a revolution, yeah? it's digitalization and artificial intelligence. And for that, it's good to look uh, what was the revolutions or industrial revolutions before. And the first was mechanization or STEM, water power. Um, the next was mass production. Then comes computer and automatization. Yeah? And um, when you look now um, what triggers all this um, revolution, then you see there was always a technology which triggered that. Yeah? For the mass production that Henry Ford can fabricated the cars here, it was electricity. And for the computer automatization, it was our micro electronics yeah? that we can build up with silicon, what I explained you with Moore's law. Now this is here what I mean with electronics. 
And you see what is now the technology we use for digitalization. And I put a uh, questionnaire marks therein. Uh, in fact, we're using still this here. Yeah. Uh, all in this sense, all technology. Yeah. And what's wrong with the old technology? There's nothing wrong. It works fine. We can do very um, intelligent systems or good computing with that. And I show you here one example. It's um, AlphaGo. It's uh, um, artificial software. And um, the guy here on the right-hand side, this is Le Sidol. This is one of the master of this game Go. It's a very complicated game. And he plays against a supercomputer. The so supercomputer AlphaGo um, is not the guy. He's just the operator. He moves <laughs> the blocks. The supercomputer is also not sitting here in that room. The supercomputer you see in the small picture here. No? This is the supercomputer. And um, at that time, it was a, a huge breakthrough in the, in the world of uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence. Then the computer wins. And this was previewed perhaps 10 years later and shows a little bit what um, this algorithm, what Kai explains us before, how, how strong they are, no? how powerful they are. But, and that's the point I like to make, again, energy consumption. Yeah? The supercomputer, needs um, more than a, a megawatt. Yeah? So you actually have to install um, next to the supercomputer a nuclear power plant just to put enough energy to the computer, where here the guy, or our brain, uh, needs something like 25 watts. Yeah? And then, makes sense, just take a look to our brain and compare this with a supercomputer. And here I put just some basic facts. Yeah. So first of all is a footprint or the weight. Yeah? The supercomputer has something like 150 tons, 150 cars. Yeah? Our brain has something like 1.4 kilograms. Yeah? The next is um, yeah, the footprint, as I said, this is a 400 meters um, cube on, on um, if you like, something like a basketball court. And here our brain has 1,300 um, centimeter cubes, smaller than a basketball actually. Yeah, it's like a small ball. Then the number of processes. Yeah? The number of processes still our brain can outperform such kind of a supercomputer. Then yeah, the supercomputer has playing uh, uh, the, the game, yeah, go, but our uh, the brain doing a lot of things, other things in parallel. Yeah? And then again, Finally, uh, when all the others not convince you, the energy consumption or the difference in the energy consumption. Next point, we talk about data. Yeah? The strategy of our brain is not big data. The strategy of our brain is small data, if you like. So in principle, for all our um, senses, like our eyes, ears, um, skin, and so on, they're coming something like 10 and uh, 10 in the power of nine bits per second to our body. Yeah? Again, it's a one with nine zeros. It's a, it's a huge number. But what data we really compute is something like 100 bits. Yeah? It's a 10 millionth reduction of data. And this is needed. Yeah? We have to reduct the data. If we store all the data, our memory capacity, which is huge in a brain, will be saturated in two, three days. So we need a data reduction, and our brain has to meet the data small. Yeah? Also, very important problem here. Good. And um, last. Just to summarize, there is a completely different strategy what we are following over the last 60 years when we're developing hardware for ICT. Yeah? Um, the first is we're making things smaller, as I explained to you by Moore's law. No? Um, and the other thing, we make things faster. No? Every, every um, new processor, what has been uh, coming out, is faster as a processor two years before. No? And the cost or the price we pay is energy, yeah, which has been increased. And then when you look now to the brain, yeah, the brain is located here in a completely other area. It's a small green point here. The so speed is very low. Yeah? I, I say a fast process, 100 hertz. 
yeah, 100 operations per second. It's a very, very fast process for the brain. We're working at Hertz, yeah? so let me say per second, 10, 50 processes. processes yeah? So a computer will not work like that. Now, when we like to re-engineer perhaps the brain or make use of them, um, it's good to take a look a little bit um, on the architecture, how uh, a brain bike works and compare this with the architecture of, of, our, um, yeah, of our brain. And what I like to claim here, and this is what I um, like to show you to you now is how we can have a paradigm shift in information technology. Yeah, this is the goal. We like to have a paradigm shift in how we handle our data and how we're doing information processing. So now let's start with a computer, um, how this works. And um, when we talk about a computer and its basic principle, these two guys, um, I think, have to mention. Um, the guy here on the left-hand side, this is Alan Turing. And he was um, the guy, he creates the Turing machine. Huh? It's a serial, it's like here, a tape. Huh? It's a serial arithmetic logic. Yeah? And the guy on the right-hand side, this is John von Neumann, and he creates the architecture of a computer in principle. This is a famous von Neumann architecture. The important point here is that um, in this von Neumann architecture, um, I not like to go in detail, is that the logic, also information processing and information storage are separated from each other. Yeah, there is a place where you do the information processing. Yeah, it's on the CPU. Um, and you do um, on another place um, the information storage. Now let's look how this basic architecture of a brain looks like. Yeah? And for that, um, I like to introduce here Ramon I. Cayal. Yeah? He was the first. He, um, figure out um, the basic structure of the brain and the basic structure of the brain, so the basic building blocks of the brain are neurons, yeah, these are the nerve cells, and the interconnection of the neurons, and Kayal called that synapses. Yeah? And now, instead of um, programming, our brain is doing learning, and learning means, and this sentence is from Kayal, that the synaptic interconnections, the synapses or the intermural connections are not fixed. They are adjusted and correspond to the input signals from the environment. So environmental signals change um, the local couplings. And to bring this in a very rough picture of an architecture, this is what you see here on the right hand side. Here, memory and logic are not more separated. Yeah? they take place in the same um, part, and we call this the Northia system. And what our brain is doing is a massive parallel computing, decentral and parallel. Yeah? This is the main difference to the computer. So now you might ask, okay, why this is good or why it's helpful or how it's working. And when I'm preparing the talk, I ask myself, how can I explain that to you that this makes sense? And then I creating here a small neural network for you. Yeah? So the, this should be the neurons, the circles, and the connections in between here, the lines should be the synapses. So, and this is our neural network, and this neural network should learn something. And let's try to learn the network something very similar, um, simple here in an apple. And all the neurons might stand for different aspects um, which you might associate with the apple or, or not. For example, the apple is round, an apple is a fruit, an apple is red, and yeah, typically not spicy. Yeah? And then my creativity was a little bit at the end at that point. Nevertheless, it's just a poor example. So this is before learning, and now you uh, our, our network learns about an apple and learning means we have an association here of the uh, elements which are um, contributing or which make an apple for an apple so red round and it's a fruit yeah it's not a vegetable and so on yeah so this is objective learning 
And this is nice, and this learning is relatively fault tolerant. No? Um, when I show you this image, it's even not more round, but you will say, okay, it's still an apple. No? And the reason for that is that also both of the other, or even if you have partial information, no? then it's through the couplings to this decentral couplings, okay, that this red and fruit will trigger also that neuron. Yeah? And when this neuron is also active, you have the same subnetwork um, active and the subnetwork network might, um, yeah, might represent an apple. Yeah? And the neurons can be also active in, an, uh, in another context, like here, tomato. It's also round, red, yeah? but it's, of course, not a fruit. Yeah? And therefore, it can perhaps bound fruit out and another subnetwork is Apple, which represents here um, not um, the tomato on the right hand side. Good. Now, how to. I'm, I said I'm the beginning, I'm a hardware guy. Now, how we can build this, how we can emulate this learning processes with an electronic circuit. And this is actually at the heart of neuromorphic engineering. And neuromorphic engineering, the term is, was created first by Xaver Med. And the idea was, uh, he created this name in the 80s of the last century, and the idea was to use at that time new electronic analog circuits to mimic neurobiological architecture, which are presented in the nerve system, as I showed you before. And two things, just only two things, but this is crazy enough. We like to um, emulate or we like to mimic with with such networks as are learning and memory. And learning is the capability to process new information, is the creation of knowledge. And memory is the capability to capture this new knowledge. No? So we're designing electronic circuits, which can do both of them in separated linked in one architecture. Good, now we found this nice GIF on the internet. Now, how to, how to do that? And, um, a nate or uh, perhaps a very easy approach is, or an easy question, what we can ask, can the brain replace by computer chips? So we have our computer chip, they are very powerful. Can we just replace a brain by the computer chip? So, and even my estimation, what I make is not completely correct. It should motivate you a little bit for the, uh, for the situation. So what I meant is just, okay, uh, the cube is um, our brain. I say, okay, I approximate by a cube, a cube of 1,000 centimeter um, yeah, cube. And a typical ship size is uh, one by one centimeter and the thickness perhaps of 0 0.5 millimeters. And then, yeah, this is what you see here in the cube. Then you can put all the, all the, um, all the ships computer ships here inside such a cube. So in total, we have something like um, 10 and the power of um, 10 transistors or single switches, what I show you in the beginning on the ship, so that in total, what we can put in into the cube when my calculation was correct is something like two by the tower of four um, ships, so 20,000 20, it meets. So whereas, the good news here, there's a good new insight when we compare the size. So this two by the power of four by times 10, we come to 14, yeah, 10 and the power of 14. And this size is actually similar to the synapses, to the intermural connection, what we have um, in our brain. So in principle, yeah, we can build enough switches onto such a space, our technology requires it. But again, what makes sense, look on the power consumption. So for the brain, we have the 25 watt. Yeah, when we break this down to this number, we have um, um, 250 femtowatts, yeah? this number, uh, a, a zero, and then comes a lot of zeros, and then comes a five. Now, if we do this with our transistors, then the power consumption is like a five nanowatts or even less, but when we then count the number, then we have one megawatt. Yeah? And now imagine brain on this size, yeah? and one megawatt is actually what produces you a nuclear plant. Yeah? And you have not to imagine a lot. You cannot put one megawatt on that space. It's impossible to do. Yeah? So, 
we are in a problem so a native or a ah, stupid approach just to replace that will not work else question what we can do and this is um now we're coming to really to my research field. What we are doing is we're searching for new materials, new devices, and those devices should actually emulating exactly the connections between the neurons. Now, this is my sketch here. And why this is so important, why we like to emulating very efficiently these connections, and this is actually the place where memory and learning takes place. Yeah, these are the two things we like to emulate. We like to emulate the processes which occurs between the neurons by new devices no? in a solid state device. So solid state device is a device where we change the resistance, the transmission through the device and depending on the signals on the neuron which are in, in front or the pre and the post side of this synapses. And how we do this, and here is one example, we're building new devices on a wafer, this are four inch, and when you zoom a little bit in, um, you see here a single device, and this device we engineer in an appropriate way that we can mimic biological learning in such kind of a, of a device. Now, this is fine, then we have a single device, we have then a single synapses, but um, how can local learning mechanisms, so, at a synapses be transferred to a multidimensional network level. Now, since our brain has a lot of neurons and uh, it's a huge, and now the question is how we can then do something which makes sense with that. And um, for that, I would say, let us make a very simple approach, perhaps not the complete huge brain, look to a very, very simple system. Yeah? And you can also put this in a more scientific language. It's what it, what we call a reductionistic approach or reductionistic system. And the most easy system from biology, what you might imagine is a unicellular organism. Yeah? And this is a amoeba. This is a kind of a unicellular organism. Yeah? It even has not a nerve system since it has only one cell. Yeah? But already this animal can do a lot of crazy things. And it's very, since it's able to solve mazes. Yeah? And there is, it's in biology, a very interesting candidate to study basic cognitive functions, so basic um, learning functions. And um, one of that I show you here, this is um, an experiment. And here um, they make a treatment um, with this amoeba. So the amoeba, when you have feed this, I say now animal, it's not really an animal, of course, when you feed that, um, by a concentration difference, for example, um, then it has a certain speed and it moves yeah, along this um, concentration gradient. So it has an average speed. And what they now done in that experiment is they change the environmental conditions for the, from favorable to unfavorable, for example, temperature, humidity. Yeah? Every time here with a temperature shock. And interesting is what they are, and. Okay, when they're doing that, what they register with the um, reducing temperature, animal stops, it's moving, huh? it's stuck. And the interesting thing is what they figure out is what happens when they do this in a periodic order. Yeah? And when they do so, what they find out is um, when they make it in a, in a certain periodic order, yeah, they can see that the animals, animal or the, the amoeba, yeah, anticipate the event. So you see here in this, in this um, speed curve that actually when the next shock should come, he slows down the movement. Yeah? So he anticipate, he has already some knowledge about it, thinks, okay, perhaps, or thinking is perhaps not the right word for any cellular organism, but he has some, uh, let's may say, think. He thinks about, oh, it comes the next temperature shock, I stop moving. Yeah? And okay, this disappears. It's also kind of intelligence. He say, okay, there is no coming temperature and it comes to this average speed. But then a single pulse, temperature pulse is enough that he again starts to do this anticipation and stopping. So. On top of this anticipation, he also has a memory. Yeah? And it's the only cellular organism. We're not talking about a nerve system. 
system here. So um, th that was the idea, and we did this years before, yeah, well, something like 10 years before, to put this in a very simple circuit, and I like to, to show you all the details of the circuit, but the circuit is very simple. Yeah? It's just a, a, a resonant circuit or resonator, yeah? uh, which we damp with one of our new memristor devices. And actually what we can see is when we have such an oscillator circuit, which we damp, and we trigger them with a periodic signal, we see that we can emulating exactly this anticipation events of CMOVIA. So we, if you like, we translate a biological finding into an electronic circuit. Good, first of all, is this um, also, gives this also a route to the brain? And can we do something useful with that. First of all, um, yes, computing with oscillations is a very important paradigm in the brain. So it's uh, called brain waves and so on. I like not to go into detail. And yeah, we can make computers, oscillatory neurocomputers. The idea at least is not new. The idea is um, 20, no, 30 years um, old, but uh, no, 20 years, it's 99, 20 years old. Um, but this idea works only when we do it in hardware. When you do it in software, again, when we put it again on a computer, the helpful is, is not. And um, just to show you that with this kind of amoeba, if you put this into a network, so um, that you can really solve some more or less daily problems, I just show you here one example. And this example um, is the tra traveling salesman problem. Now, traveling salesman problem, I explain here with the sentence, or you can look here on the map from Germany. Um, and the question is just to find the shortest route here by passing 15 cities inside Germany, now, 15 largest cities. Um, now it's not among the 15 largest cities in Germany. <laughs> Um, and you have to find the shortest route, visiting every city one times, and come back to the starting city. In this case, it is Berlin. Berlin, yeah. And um, yeah, you can calculate that possible routes, and you see it's a big number. What comes out, and uh, this is computational, very expensive. Yeah? We talk about for the experts among you. We talk about the NP hard problem here. Yeah? It's ex completely expensive. And what means NP hard problem again is when you're now increasing the numbers with two cities is easy, with three cities again. But when you increase the number of cities, the computational time will exponentially rise. Yeah? Or even the exponential uh, or the cost. Yeah? What you have to spend rises exponentially. Again, yeah? the exponential growth we have seen today already at several places. There is also something general inside. And now in that paper by this uh, Japanese group, what they did is they built up an Amobia computing core here, or um, they call this Amobia inspired computing core. And what you then see is that and this is the differences, and this is the great difference, is that the solution for the search item is not more depending on the number of cities. Yeah. So when you have Large amount of cities, this is computational, not more dependent on the number of cities. It's clear, it's decentral computing. Yeah, it's a parallel and decentral computing. And with this, you can solve large problems, perhaps decoding Bitcoin <laughs> chains, something like this, probably. Okay. Now, I like to come a little bit here to the end of my talk, um, but I have to say there's a long way to go and I put a questionnaire um, to a wheel towards uh, memory computing. So to come today from a digital computer to a neuromorphic computer. And when you look through the internet, people are very optimistic about that. I'm a little bit more skeptical. So uh, up to 2030, people hope, and there's a lot of research going in, pushing in that field to really do an a uh, neuromorphic computer. And a neuromorphic computer means a computer where we have memory and logic 
linked. Yeah? But of course, there are intermediate stats. This is hybrid computing, and this is something what people are doing and which comes more and more hopefully on the market. And what is previewed to come on the market is in five, six years is um, something like a system where you have some memory and logic unit inside the normal von Neumann architecture. Né? And this is actually the way um, hardware guys are going at the moment. And with that, since you highlighted, I should talk about the project, what we are doing, Memristive, uh, the project Memwork, Memristive Materials for Neomorphic Electronics. Just shortly, we're working also on that. So what we are doing is we're designing new materials, we're designing which are embedded in an artificial neural network. And this artificial neural network should interact with the environment, for example, like with the amoeba, with the stimuli um, of the temperature. And this requires new materials. These are the people in our labs working on new technologies to build up new systems, new devices. We cannot work with the, with the old technique, or by, but we can combine them. Also advanced analytics. We like to understand a little bit the physics behind the material. We like to understand also a little bit how that behaves or to, to figure out some problems. And also we build up um, new systems and all this we do here in our um, neuromorphic lab um, Ilmenau. And with that, now what is now about our digital paradise? This is my um, concluding slide. Again, what I like that you take home with you, production and operation of ICT will rise exponentially to about 21% of the energy consumption in 2020. And the development of our plan B or of our plan A is just at the beginning. We push them forward to a paradigm shift to energy efficient system, architecture that work locally, where we handle small data. For that, we need new materials, with able technologies. And the big question is to what extent we can and we will mimic the brain and what are the fundamental limits since um, this is not understand in particle and this is a big remark here what I like to give is the brain code. So how the brain is working is not yet known. Nobody can know some. So we make here a development without a master plan. And obviously this is somehow a little bit difficult. Okay, then this is, um, these are some of the members of our Ilmenau lab for neuromorphic electronics, all the activists, and with that, which I like to thank. And of course, I like to thank you for your attention and hope you are still in front of your computer. So thank you very much, Professor Ziegler, for this very insightful talk and also inviting us to imagine a future where we actually are able to tackle um, the challenge that we have created with our own ingenuity. And I'm pretty sure that we have several questions coming in. I've already read a few, but before we take them, we will again take a quick five minute break so we can set ourselves up and then enter into a conversation. So thank you again and see you in a bit.
All right. So welcome back. Uh, we will have, I hope, a very engaging Q&A with our uh, speakers. I would head right into it with a question from our audience. And the first question asked by Tino is about what proportion of energy used for computing at my place and the energy uh, of cloud computing when the data is computed there. So I think he's talking about how much energy is consumed at his own place and at, say, um, cloud computing center. And um, what amount of that energy would be needed when I use cloud computing instead of computing at my place? So if he has to completely trans transfer his computing to a cloud system, how much difference would that make? Or would you have any comments on that? So let me try. Um, it depends, of course, um, what you do with computation. Yeah, If it's, let's say, just uh, if the most of the computation is something that uh, happens in the cloud because you process some data, you do some learning tasks, then nothing is needed locally. Uh, if it's uh, online gaming, for example, then it's basically two parts. One part is to uh, store all the movies and to uh, send the movies over the network, and then locally you have to your your computer has to decompress it and show it. So it's um, um, on both sides. So it really depends on what kind of computation you're talking about. Okay. Um, yes, I think. With that detail lacking, we could also move on uh, to the next part of our questions. And uh, Jordan asks, um, how can developing countries move from coal-based electricity sources to a greener one, but with cheap and can produce a huge amount of electricity? Or I think also, would that be possible to replace coal? <laughs> I don't know if we are the, the right experts to answer that question. I but we, we should move from coal to green energy. Yeah, it's absolutely necessary to do it. Mm. At least that's my point. I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Professor Ziegler, I think you demonstrated uh, that in your project, you have a lot of work with different areas. I think you were combining several different fields. And also, this MEMVAC project is um, definitely highly interdisciplinary. And talking about that aspect, um, how important do you think it is to work in those directions? And what do you see as the possibilities right now beyond your own project or in general? So the, the importance, I hope I make clear in my talk, I mean, um, when you see the numbers, what you first have seen by, by Kai's talk and then after in my talk, when we have in 15 years, not more, or the energy what we're producing are not more enough to, to feed our ICT world, what, what is then um, the solution? Yeah? The solution can be we have to produce more energy so we can start to build new energy plants. Yeah, when we're talking about our climate, and this is yeah, here um, the topic of that week we, we, you are working on, is this perhaps not the right strategy? Yeah? The next thing is we have then to talk about resources. This can happen that in 15 years, every person has a certain amount, um, like data volume, also energy volume perhaps, that everyone has, I don't know how many, 10 kilo, kilowatt hours per day, and when you're using more, then it will increase in the price or you just stopped <laughs> in, in, in having electricity, something like this would be happen. Yeah? Or, and this is a strategy we are working on, we think about um, new devices, a new kind of information technology um, where we're producing less energy demand devices. And you ask about the future. You know, at the moment, a, a lot of also from the big companies like Intel and IBM, they push a lot towards um, this direction since um, 
It has also to do something, of course, with money at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah? since you can earn a lot of money as well when you find your new, um, new strategies. Um, yeah, um, I show in one of the last slides what is the roadmap from industry and from people for the next 10 years. But I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical that in 10 years we have really a neuromorphic computers on the market that you can go then to, to some, some, some computer store and, and can decide between a digital or a neuromorphic uh, computer. There, I'm a little bit scared about that. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, Professor Sattler was also talking at the end of his uh, slides and his talk that the best way is to actually not consume this energy. Um, do you also have some thoughts about um, how we could actually reduce our footprint uh, in that sense? You ask me? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think not all what's possible, what technologically possible is, uh, should be done. So there are a couple of things that we really have to ask ourselves if it's necessary. I mentioned this Bitcoin mining, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't say anything against cryptocurrencies. There are better ways and better algorithms for doing this, so that's one. Um, then we have what you said is this volume uh, or limitation of volume. Yeah? Uh, perhaps you should stop after uh, two movies per day yeah, and um, think about what your which services are used. And um, if you have several providers, you can also look at other, not only on the price, but perhaps on, on the carbon footprint of this, of this provider. So these are things we can do. And then, yeah, switch off your, your devices, go out and uh, enjoy the day. It's much, much better than always looking uh, movies and playing online games. I mean, it's, uh, it's fun, you can do this, but not the whole day. All right, yes, yeah. sometimes the simple solutions could yeah. also <laughs> be considered. Okay, so we have, uh, as you know, a Discord a channel where we are getting questions and aspects. And um, we also have a current discussion there going on about uh, going carbon neutral. So as, as you might know, uh, of course, that several countries are pledging uh, going carbon neutral until a certain year. Um, and then there are some ambitious goals like by countries like China, which talk about going carbon neutral by 2060. Um, and in that regard, I think in your talks, you both explained the, the scale of the issue we're talking about. You really gave us quite some figures and statistics. So in your opinion, would you have some um, thoughts on that? Would you have some um, ideas about your recommendations for the larger society in, in going carbon neutral or what are we really doing to reduce our footprint? So is there an option? I mean, 2060 is uh, much too late. So we all know the numbers um, from researchers um, about this um, increasing temperatures, this global warming. Uh, so I think we have to reduce this to one or two degrees and um, we should do whatever is necessary to, to stop this. And again, what you have to imagine, we have an exponential growth. You see that for, I, I show that for, um, for the devices uh, or for, for the ICT sector, but you can recalculate the curve, of course, with amount of carbon, what you put here into, into the environment. And that's an exponential growth. So every year we wait, yeah, or every two years we wait, we just double. So if we wait two years, when we, when we are in exponential growth, we have doubled that. It's something I think all of you know from, from the situation at the moment with coronavirus, yeah, with the pandemic. If we wait two weeks, then it's too late. Yeah? And there is a, at the point of no return. So we cannot wait more than two years. It's, it's now the time to act. Uh, and we are already too late. It's not what you typically hear. It's not um, five minutes before before twelve. We are five minutes, in my opinion, after twelve o'clock. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So that that does bring quite a sense of urgency in addressing that issue. And um, 
my, from my point of view, I would also have a personal question to you. I think you did mention a bit of your personal views. Um, as, as, as people who are having quite some influence in, in the society, also with your research and say your positions, how do you see yourself contributing to addressing the, the issue or the challenges that we're talking about? Are you also engaged uh, beyond uh, your research work and actions? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, of course, you can stop driving your car, uh, <laughs> taking your bicycle uh, whenever it's possible. I think three things are necessary. The first is uh, a change in our behavior. Uh, that includes, of course, me as well. We need uh, regulations uh, for doing this. Otherwise, people are not forced to change their behavior. And the third one is what uh, Martin showed. Uh, we need also new technologies that help uh, to solve this. Yeah, we cannot continue with the technologies we have. Otherwise, we have to modify or we change and update our, our behavior significantly. Yes. Yes. You also like to know my opinion yes. about that or my motivation. Yeah, my motivation is, I mean, as a physicist or engineer, what I can do, what I can do is I can work on more energy efficient um, devices and more new strategies and look how we can do information processing in a more smarter way. Yeah? This is my contribution from my daily work. Of course, at home, yeah, I have two kids. I explain them all. A video game at the evening is 20 times that. I mean, I can <laughs> uh, deliver that. And um, two years before, there was this, um, perhaps not all known, this Friday for Future, um, though, uh, school kids are uh, not going to school at Friday, they're going out. Yeah? Okay, there was a, a huge debate at the end. I like that since it's, man, it's your future, it's your planet, it's our planet, man. and we have to do something against that. But I also say to my kids, uh, what is with one um, evening not um, shedding all the day with Discord, <laughs> playing uh, online videos, just come down <laughs> to the living room and we look at the television a video in the old fashion. And yeah, um, at that you have to change your, your private behavior. Let the car, use the bike, or use the, um, use the train, the tram. Um, and uh, change also a little bit your habitude. But at the end, I mean, at the moment with the coronavirus, okay, it's, it's hard. Huh? So it's a digital world is our, <laughs> Our only way to stay in contact with a lot of people, especially for the people here, no? for the younger ones. Okay, uh, thank you. And um, also in a similar direction, we have a question, um, particularly for uh, Professor Ziegler, but also Professor Sattler could talk about it. Um, so we are talking a lot about how uh, technology has also brought us or brought along with it the issue of energy consumption and that we need to deal with that issue. Um, and along with that, you presented some possibilities for addressing that issue. So with your memristors and so on. And in that regard, do you also see the um, possibility that these new developments itself bring some more uh, challenges, maybe with energy consumption or with something else. Uh, would you have some ideas about how to actually not create new problems while solving the previous ones? <laughs> this is a very good question and a very difficult to answer this question. Um, with every new technology, you every time creating new problems. Yeah? When Einstein wrote down the famous formula, energy is mass and speed of light and squared, he's not thinking on an atom bomb, mm -hmm. which has been developed 20 years later or 30 years later. Yeah? So um, every invention what you can make, you can make in, uh, you can take in a good way or you can take in a bad way. Yeah? Um, this is something I, in principle, I cannot answer. Of course, um, there will be drawbacks of, about the things we are doing. Um, 
and there is no black and white. There's not a good thing or a, a completely a bad thing. There, there's grayscales in between. And yeah, of course, there can be things coming up, which also brings us to new problems. You know? So the question was also more directed to you um, personally, say as a um, leading engineer, how do you ensure that these problems um, can firstly be identified in time, but also hopefully be avoided? Are you taking any measures also say on the point of ethics or um, those kind of directions? Yeah, of course I have my, my of course my private ethics yeah, I, against weapons, mm -hmm. of course. I show you this Amoebia, which can do anticipations. I think you can also imagine for uh, for people which fabricating some smart weapons, it can be very interesting. Um, autonomous driving cars, <laughs> autonomous driving drones, for example, um, anticipating making recognition, all this it's, can be used um, to do bad things on the way. And of course, I'm not interested on that. So I, I like more to go in the medical health application part. This is where I have a strong, uh, stronger motivation with colleagues working together at, uh, at university hospitals. Um, we're making Alzheimer research, making models of how we might uh, trigger that. But nevertheless, I'm to say it very clearly, I, I cannot say or not exclude that some of the invention, what we bring at the moment and what I contributing in the field will be used for something very bad. But it's very difficult to decide. Just look at this example of this Bitcoins. Yeah, the guy who has invented this had never thought that people will build farms up to make money by creating blocks. Yeah. That was not the problem of this invention. So, um, yeah, you can, of course, avoid weapons and all the stuff that's easy, yeah, but uh, yeah, there's always this kind of discussion of dual use and uh, it's very difficult to decide. Mm -hmm. um, so also, yeah, Professor Sattler, if you'd like to talk about your role in um, making sure we actually have more boon from technology than Bane, it, would you also have some ideas about your personal work? or your personal efforts in doing that, also as the president of our university? So uh, these are, let's say, two levels. The first is uh, I have this, very, the same ethics as, as Martin, so I will not work in any projects which are related to weapons. I could say I'm doing databases, so that's something uh, with, of course, it could be used in weapons, but um, yeah, it's uh, like, like any kind of software. So that's the first. The second is uh, the university level. We have regulations for this, so nobody is basically allowed to, to um, do this um, kind of research. But as I said before, it's very difficult to decide. Yeah, And we have a, a commission that um, where when you work in something that is, uh, or where is a, let's say, a danger of doing this, or you are not sure where is a risk, then this commission um, looks at this project and decides finally if, uh, if a professor or the researcher are allowed to work on this. All right, thank you. But um, let me uh, just add one thing. For example, the internet was uh, developed because people um, in the army or the military uh, were, have uh, supported this. And yeah? not everything that is done there is, is really a bad thing. Yeah. Yes, um, I guess that's a constant effort that engineers, scientists, and society has to put effort towards ensuring uh, the positive use of technology. Um, with that said, I think uh, we have one last question. I think it's going back to the consumption part again. And uh, the person asks, um, does optimizing lead to more consumption possibilities uh, than less consumption as history has proven? So like the um, telephone in the beginning had a different use than it has now after we've improved that technology. Would you have any comments or reflections on that? So um, telephone is a good example. So when we optimize this, but what we have produced is a, is a large demand on, on smartphones taking more energy. So um, I don't know if optimization always helps. 
What do you think, Martin? <laughs> yeah, you can optimize every time in two directions. So, yeah, this, uh, the telephone or the smartphone is not more a telephone at the moment. No? So the majority of time you're using really to call someone with your, with your cell phone. <laughs> no? um, since we bring more options, more um, things inside that, um, yeah, of course, we can make an over, uh, over um, optimization of things. But for the energy consumption, I mean, um, we are far away <laughs> for, for, for making this discussion if we uh, optimize too much. So from, from, from the general point of view, I would say there is a strong need for optimizing energy consumption and we far away to discuss is this really still necessary to do a little bit more. And by the way, I mean, it's like, um, it's, a, it's a famous curve in semiconductor industry, it's a parabolic. So when you're bringing more of the devices, more of the switches, what I show you on my, in my talk on one wafer, you will producing in one production step more single switches means the company can earn more money. So it's good to have a lot of devices, but this goes up to a certain point and you have to need more and more technology yeah, to producing this tiny, tiny switches. And that, that comes to one point and then um, to make things smaller will drastically increase. There's an exponential quadratic growth on the other side again for the cost. Yeah? And then it makes no more sense to optimizing more technology to make it more tiny than the price what you have to tell them to pay is even much higher yeah, than um, when you like to sell that yeah? so what, or the price what the company have to take in, in um, as when you go, for example, with, um, with a second wafer where you put the devices on. All right. Um, so thank you for your uh, patience and also honesty in addressing the questions we've had. Uh, we, with this, we've almost reached the end of our event, given the time. And um, I would like to thank you both, Professor Sattler and Professor Ziegler, for your time and for engaging with ISVI and the participants and the conference. We are very appreciative of your um, efforts in making this possible. And um, given the topic, we would also hope that um, you continue your cutting edge research and to actually help humanity address the challenge of energy consumption, but also looking at the ethical as aspects of technological development. Um, and again, thank you for your time. Um, we will also then complete this event by thanking everyone who's put the effort to make this event possible. We are recording it from our university and uh, have taken all the measures to make it Corona safe and to do it in presence here. With that, uh, also we thank the FEM and the I staff for making the technological, uh, making it technologically possible. And of course, the ISWI 2021 organizing team, which have put efforts across uh, over time for two years, and uh, I think they've done a brilliant job. So please uh, thank them for that. And yes, the conference has just started. I'm sure there will be many, many more stimulating and engaging conversations that you would have uh, uh, basically across the world because everyone's uh, at different places. And uh, I would also then invite you for tomorrow's uh, keynote lecture at 10 a.m. Um, Central European time, based on the topic of the causes and effects of climate change, providing a, um, a clear and concise overview of the challenge we're talking about and providing a common ground to our uh, future discussions and conversations. So with that said, um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sankalp and it was a pleasure hosting this event. Thank you everyone.